Hello and welcome to February 17th in space history and we begin with the Vanguard 2 launch. Occurring on this date in 1959, this launch followed the Vanguard 1 launch which put the second successful US satellite into orbit. Here you see the Vanguard 1 and here you see a Vanguard being prepared for launch here. Unfortunately, the Vanguard program had a lot of failures initially. After all, this was right at the beginning of the space race and there were mishaps. And so you see here one of the initial spectacular mishaps on the launch pad. Incidentally, the launcher is also called Vanguard. The probe is called Vanguard. And in fact, the first stage engine is called Vanguard as well, though it also goes by X405. I do believe we have better footage of this particular explosion here. Three, two, one, Fire. mark. never like to see that happen and even when the Vanguard launched it sometimes had trouble. For instance on this launch, on this launch it manages to leave launch pad but as Ed Burlhe of Universal Newsreels explains... One circuit in the control system breaks down and Defense Department cameras record a pinwheel of fire. Another disaster for Project Vanguard. Yes, but eventually Vanguard 1 was successful. Vanguard 1 was a 1.47 kilogram satellite and here you see the Vanguard 1 launch which did put that satellite into orbit after Explorer 1 which was the first satellite for the United States. Vanguard 1 is still in orbit by the way. It will take about 240 years for its orbit to decay and for it to finally uh, drop down into the atmosphere. This was Vanguard 1 and they scaled up. This is Vanguard 2. And so Vanguard 2 was a 9.8 kilogram satellite, much larger. And here you see the fairing separation being tested and the satellite deployment there. You can see its little antenna. Looks a lot like Sputnik. But here we have a simulated launch in Kerbal Space Program of Vanguard. I tried to make it look as close as possible. The first stage is the Vanguard stage uh, X405 by GE. 134.7 kilonewtons burning for 145 seconds. The fuel is kerosene and liquid oxygen. This launch is not in real time by the way. I've condensed it a little bit uh, for your enjoyment. Vanguard 2's purpose by the way was to measure cloud cover for 19 days. It too is still in orbit and will remain in orbit for about 300 years. And that's because it's in a very high orbit of course. The Vanguard program in total had three successes and eight failures. So after Vanguard 2, there was a Vanguard 3. And here we see the second stage lit. The second stage was a Delta A stage with an Aerojet AJ-1037 burning at 33.8 kilonewtons for 115 seconds. It used nitric acid and UDMH. The total mass of the rocket, by the way, was only 10.05 tons. It stood at 23 meters. Here we see the third stage, which is a Grand Central Solid, 11.6 kilonewtons, burning for 31 seconds to complete orbit and bring it to its high apoapsis. The final orbit for the rocket was 560 by 2,953 kilometers, and it's because of that 2,953 kilometers that it will be staying in orbit for quite a while. And so it was successful, though this isn't quite right. It was spin stabilized. Unfortunately, you can't do that while time warping in Kerbal Space Program. So uh, if we could perhaps turn to uh, a visualization that was produced at the time, that will give a more accurate picture perhaps. Indeed, that's basically what they envisioned it looking like. Of course, they couldn't actually see what it would look like, but uh, there you have it. Um, I guess there is a logic to making your satellites look a little bit spherical with little antennae poking out and indeed a very popular popular motif among early satellites. So Vanguard 2 launched on this date in 1959. 
Next up, we have Ranger 8, which was launched on this date in 1965 on the Atlas rocket with the Agena second stage. I don't have very good uh, video of the preparation of the Ranger 8, but here's what it looked like. It was a Mark III version of the Ranger probe meant to smash into the moon and take a bunch of pictures on the way down while relaying those pictures using its antennae back to base. And that's what the solar panels were powering, cameras and antennae. So here we go with a simulated launch of the Atlas rocket. The Atlas program was a competitor to the Vanguard program and this rocket had already been used by 1965 to launch the Mercury astronauts into orbit. As you can see, the first stage has three engines, a core engine which burned at 300 kN worth of thrust for five minutes, and then two booster engines on the side, on a side skirt which burned combined 1,040 kN for 134 seconds or thereabouts, depending on the payload and the configuration of the rocket, depending on what second stage it was carrying. And they all burned kerosene and liquid oxygen from the same tank, making this a very unique configuration where instead of staging a tank and engines, it, this rocket just staged the engines, just staged the booster engines as you saw right there, and continued burning the center engine, which continued to be fueled from the center tank. And so this was a one and a half stage initial configuration, and then on top of that one and a half stages, they added the Agena stage, and later the Centaur stage. Now, Ranger 8 was not the first lunar impact probe to take a lot of pictures of the moon. Uh, Ranger 7 did that already. However, the target for Ranger 8 was the Sea of Tranquility, where Apollo 11 would land. And so this information was very critical to planning that later mission to land astronauts on the moon. Here we have the second stage, the Agena stage. The Agena stage was powered by a Bell Aerospace A247 which uh, burned UDMH and inhibited red fuming nitric acid. Its thrust was 71 kilonewtons and it burned for 265 seconds. This stage would get this rocket into orbit and then would also transfer the Ranger 8 to the moon. And so it had a lot of work to do, uh, very similar to the third stage of the Saturn V rocket in terms of getting into orbit first and then uh, doing the lunar transfer. The probe itself did have a tiny little hydrazine engine which burned with a thrust of 224 newtons, not kilonewtons, that's 0.224 kilonewtons, and that it was used solely for mid-course correction. It had little maneuvering thrusters which burned nitrogen. And so we see here the probe being released from the Agena stage after the translunar injection. Uh, this was the best I could do to make the probe look correct, but there are flaws in this. The wingspan of the solar panels is a little bit wide, and also I couldn't get a hexagonal structure at the bottom there. But otherwise, I thought it was a fairly good uh, replica of what we saw at the beginning of this segment. Now there is video from Ranger 8 on the business end of things, in other words, when it was going to impact the moon. Of course, we have that video from multiple cameras. The, the probe had six TV cameras, two wide angle and four narrow angle. And so we'll get the view from many angles. Altogether, uh, more than 7,000 photos were uh, taken before it crashed. The last 23 minutes of its approach have been condensed here. Uh, the actual impact velocity, by the way, was 2,680 meters per second, around there. That's around 6,000 miles an hour. So here we see another view of that particular impact being sped up quite dramatically. Do not let your probes do this in Kerbal Space Program. Here is actually a multiple view, so you can see the comparison between the wide-angle cameras and the narrow-angle cameras. The narrow angle cameras, of course, being the ones at the bottom where the image is moving quite quickly. And you can see the sort of resolution that the Ranger 8 was able to deliver back home and uh, the details that they would then be able to use for future mission planning. Lastly, here we have a more straight on approach. Uh, this camera was uh, clearly. Uh, right right on the perfect location for the most dramatic kind of impact video. 
And there you have Ranger 8. Last but not least, we have the Nier Shoemaker probe that was launched on this date in 1996. The new Shoemaker was meant to rendezvous with an asteroid called Eros. Nier actually stands for Near Earth Asteroid Rendezvous, and it is named after Eugene Shoemaker, the planetary scientist who discovered the Shoemaker Comet. This is Eros, by the way, uh, imaged after Nier got to it, of course. So we got this image thanks to Nier. But uh, I do not have a launch video. This is as close as I could get in a launch image. So let's just go to the simulated launch in Kerbal Space Program. The launch occurred on this date in 1996 and it was aboard a Delta II rocket, specifically a Delta II 7925-8. The 7 indicates that the first stage engine is an RS-27A which has a total thrust of 1,054.2 kN at maximum, and it burns for 265 seconds. It burns kerosene and liquid oxygen, just as all the rockets that we've covered in this day in space history. The 9 indicates it has 9 boosters, and 6 were lit initially, and those 6 were dropped off as they were spent, and then the remaining 3 were ignited, as you saw there. And so that was the 9 in the designation of the Delta II. Now, while the first stage is still going on, I'll mention that while Eros, the asteroid, was the target of this launch, this probe was also supposed to fly by another asteroid on its way. It was supposed to fly by Matilda, and it did so on uh, June 27, 1997. So it first flew by Matilda, and then it had to rendezvous with Eros. And so we see here the Delta II continuing with uh, the two little vernier engines that you see there. If you saw the two little flames on the side there, uh, those are vernier engines that help with maneuvering the rocket. Here's stage separation. And now this is the second stage, which is an AJ-10, a Delta K, which is related to the earlier AJ-10 that we saw. This one develops 43.6 kilonewtons and burns for 431 seconds. This is actually the 2 in the 7925 designation. So that 2 indicates that there is the second stage, the Delta K stage, burning Erosine and N2O4. You can see here the third stage, which is actually the 5 in the designation, and that is the Star 48B solid booster, the PAM-D, which burns at a thrust of 66 kilonewtons for 87 seconds and it's that stage that will make the the transfer out so it will push the probe to escape velocity and get it on its trajectory to Mathilda first and then there will be further corrections in order to get the probe first to do a swing by of Earth and then onward to its final destination of the asteroid Eros. Uh, that staging did not go quite as I intended in the simulation, but nothing harmed. Uh, the probe was still fine. Unfortunately, I do not have an asteroid set up in the simulation to match the orbits of Matilda or Eros. So, so let's take a quick look at what turned out to be a more complicated path that the Near Shoemaker probe took to its target. You see here the launch on this date in 1996, and then the flyby of Matilda on June 27th, and then a flyby of Earth on January 23rd, 1998. Then you see a first flyby of Eros. At that point, it attempted to do orbital insertion, but failed. We don't know why, but it started tumbling, and it ran out of the propellant margin. It still had the main propellant, but there was a margin added to the estimations, and it ran out of that margin. NASA almost lost the probe due to battery drain at that point, but they managed to recover it. Here's some video it captured of Earth as it flew by on its flyby during the trajectory and it was at a steep inclination to match Eros so that's why we get the south pole here but uh, that footage courtesy of Doug Ellison from JPL. And this is a NASA animation of how the probe was supposed to eventually land on the surface of Eros after completing its mission and so you can see they were planning to do uh, a rather cute little landing of the probe. It did orbital insertion on February 14, 2000 and landed on the asteroid, made a soft landing on the asteroid by the way, on February 12, 2001. 
Here's the actual video from the probe as it approached the surface. Uh, not, not too different from uh, Ranger 8 except this approach was